Man crates. Awesome gifts for men in real wooden crates. Wrapped in a cocoon of duct tape. Or housed in ammo cans that are virtually indestructible. Some gifts he'll get to assemble himself. Some gifts you'll beg him to share. And some gifts are sealed inside layers of rock-solid concrete. Gifts guys love. From grilling gear to old-school video games and more. Man crates. Awesome gifts for men. And welcome into the Cam Rogers Show on this Friday, September 22nd, 2017. We thank you for tuning into the program. We're taking you up until 11 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. It is, of course, 10 o'clock on the East Coast right now. And yes, indeed, we are presented by Man Crates. Hey, ladies, do you have that special main squeeze out there and you just don't know what to get him? Go to mancrates.com slash chat sports. You can get this box covered in duct tape filled with masculinity. I mean, beef jerky, beer, golf gear, fishing supplies, anything under the sun that a guy would like. So definitely go on to mancrates.com slash chat sports. That is our sponsor here on the Cam Rogers Show today. So check it out. And uh, we thank Man Crates for being a part of the program. And it is a jam-packed one at that. A lot to get to throughout the hour here. Of course, we'll get into our headlines in just a few seconds, as we always do. I have my opening rant as well, where I'll be talking about a pretty serious topic that really needs to be discussed in the mainstream right now regarding college football. At 10.15, we'll have Pete Shepard of ESPN Radio 99.3 out there in Southwest Florida. Good to see that he is doing well after uh, what was really a devastating uh, hurricane in the Sunshine State. And of course, Pete Shepard, uh, formerly of WEEI in Boston as well. So we know is all about the Boston media. Looking forward to chatting with him later in the show. And then we will get to the Can't Miss Games. This weekend, I am planning your schedule for you. I am so nice. How about that? So I'll go through the three top games for this weekend that you certainly cannot miss. And then we have Sarah Perlman, Masson Zone. She covers the Nationals and the Baltimore Orioles out there in the Beltway. Very knowledgeable person in the MLB and the entire sporting world. Fellow graduate, class of 2017 from Florida. She, I was, of course, from Maryland, but we were the same age. We're looking forward to kind of having a nice discussion about the broadcasting industry and the big storyline surrounding the MLB. Looking forward to that chat. And then the final word today regarding scheduling with the PGA Tour and the, uh, the football schedule and how the PGA Tour really needs to look at themselves in the mirror and make some amendments if they want to see their ratings be okay and not bleed into the college football NFL season. So that is our lineup for today. Again, we want you commenting, engaging, getting lit on this show here today. So throw out those comments, react to whatever I'm blabbing about. We want to hear from you and we'll show the best comments on the show right here live. So looking forward to that, of course. You can get the podcast version of the Cam Rogers Show after this program. Oh, I'd say about at the midway point of the day today. We'll have that up on iTunes and Google Play for those Team No iPhone people. Just search the Cam Rogers Show. So without any further ado, let's get into those headlines. And we start off with, as we always do on Friday mornings, Thursday Night Football. And it was like kind of entertaining. The... Los Angeles Rams took on the San Francisco 49ers in what was quite a shootout. The Rams ended up winning that one 41-39, and Los Angeles improves to 2-1-1 on the year, while San Francisco falls to 0-3. And it was a pretty wacky game, as we have some of the highlights here that we'll show in a matter of seconds. What happened at the end was the 49ers recovered an onside kick and were starting to surge into Los Angeles territory. What happened was a crazy PI call on Trent Taylor uh, for apparently pushing off on one of the Los Angeles corners. So it would have been a first down because it was a catch. Uh, and so they called the PI, had to move the 49ers offense back 15 yards and it was fourth and 20 and that was the end of it. But really a fantastic game for the Rams offense. 107 points through three games. For a comparison, Seattle has just 21 through two games. So the Rams are definitely going to have more points than the Seahawks through week three. Jared Goff, a really fantastic evening, 22-28, 
292 yards, three touchdowns, a near perfect QBR. As we have the highlights here right for you, Brian Hoyer in that game for the Niners at the quarterback position. He had an okay affair, 23 of 37, 332 yards, two touchdowns and a pick. But he was sacked four times, and that was the difference, really. I mean, Jared Goff was clean all night. And we're talking about an offensive line that has improved in Los Angeles. So the Rams looking like a sneaky good, perhaps, division contender in the NFC West. Definitely a wild card contender right now. They didn't have a great performance against Washington in week two. But they bounced back nicely in this one. Todd Gurley, 28 carries, 113 yards, two touchdowns. I talked about this on the MVP Power Ranking show. Todd Gurley has the best shot at being the MVP from the running back position this year. The guy is legit. Uh, he was kind of under the radar in fantasy circles because he had such a bad year, too. But he's coming on. And how about Robert Woods as well? The speedster, six receptions, 108 yards. If the Rams can continue that sort of production, look out for this team. Next headline here, the Cowboys. Ezekiel Elliott. Oh, man, Ezekiel Elliott. So he, uh, he's making no excuses right now for his lack of effort in a, in a particular play versus the Denver Broncos. We have it right here. He told Pro Football Talk, quote, I would say I was just very frustrated, but that's no excuse for the lack of effort I showed on tape. And we are talking about the interception play by Aqib Tlaib. Here's a nicer look here. So Ezekiel Elliott essentially putting his hands on his hips, etc., and with it being the Dallas Cowboys, with it being America's Game of the Week for CBS that week, he's going to get a lot of flack. And we want you to weigh in on this because it was one play. It's a very small sample size. But did Zeke give up on his team last week? And I would argue that the Cowboys gave up on the Cowboys last week. So again, comment. Let us know what you think because it was just... A poor performance overall for the Dallas Cowboys in that game. They laid an egg. They were perhaps feeling a little too good after that win against the New York football Giants. And look, complacency was probably a factor. We can't just put it on Zeke. But we want to know what you think. Let us know in terms of that play that we just showed you, Zeke putting his hands on his hips after that interception. You know, Skip Bayless actually brought up an interesting point yesterday on Fox Sports 1 saying that Zeke really isn't used to running those downfield routes and that was a downfield route there and he was kind of out of the play in a sense so maybe it was a weird situation where Zeke was in no man's land. I don't know. I don't want to make excuses for the guy but that's certainly a reason as to uh, why he just kind of, you know, purportedly gave up on the play. So weigh in. We'll get your comments uh, throughout the program here today. Next headline, the University of Nebraska fired their athletic director, Sean Eichhorst, yesterday following years of poor on-field performance. So the national search for a new athletic director is on. Eichhorst, of course, uh, during his regime, had okay recruiting, but look, the success in the basketball realm as well as the football realm, not really there. So I think that's the, that was the problem for Nebraska. They had enough chancellor of the school fired him, and the search is on for a new athletic director in Nebraska. A, a school, by the way, that prides itself on athletic success. Uh, next headline here, the attorney for Aaron Hernandez announced yesterday that the former tight end had severe signs of CTE in his brain, and Aaron's daughter is now suing the NFL and the Patriots for indicating to Hernandez that the sport was indeed safe to play. So it looks like the Aaron Hernandez situation is going to go on a little further, at least in the civil side of things. I think this is really significant. It's going to fall in line with my opening rant here that I'll get to in a couple of minutes because CTE, football, injuries, fatalities coming to the forefront of society. Next headline here, we'll wrap up with the MLB. They're vowing to implement more netting in its stadiums after a tragic foul ball accident in Wednesday night's Yankees-Minnesota Twins game. Uh, Commissioner Rob Manfred released a statement saying, quote, we will redouble our efforts on this important issue. And uh, just a friendly reminder, we are presented by Man Crates, www.mancrates.com slash chat sports. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to think of myself as a Symbol of masculinity, at least. Maybe I'm the one person that believes that. I do have my Old Spice body wash that I throw on. You know, I'm feeling good in the morning. So I'm a big fan of man crates as well. 
a box covered in duct tape with whatever a guy would like. Golf gear, beer, beef jerky, everything under the sun that is dude-esque. So definitely check out mancrates.com slash chat sports. And ladies out there, buy that special someone a nice little package today. All right. Opening rant time. CBS Sports came out with a story that there were two college football-related deaths on Saturday. There have been five directly related college football deaths from 2002 up until that Saturday. Robert Tyree Grace is one of them. We have his image right now. In 2017, why am I still seeing stories about this? This is a situation where there is no clear answer as to why this happened. There is no clear solution. But we have to take better steps forward than this. I mean, this is ridiculous and it's sickening and I hate to see it. A kid born in 1998 losing his life with his whole life ahead of him due to football related deaths, injuries. And so for his situation, this cornerback here, he, out of Midwestern State, by the way, basically tackled a player and uh, had a very severe neck injury, and he passed away. Another player, an offensive lineman out of Kent State, lost his life due to excessive heat stroke. So one is tackling, one is lack of nourishment. Where does this fall? The coaching staff. Why is the coaching staff not being involved, and not being better facilitators for their players. Look, these are just kids, 18, 19, 20-somethings like me. And I feel like we're still in a time back like in the 1950s when drinking water was a weakness. And players are sprinting and doing these conditioning drills in the huge heat that is sweeping the country right now. Uh, in the south, it, it's still summer, it seems. It certainly is in Dallas right now. And it falls on the coaches. So you have the fundamentals of tackling that the coaches need to get better at. And you have the facilitation of the players that the coaches have to get better at in terms of more water breaks. Being real with yourself. Should you be doing conditioning outside in, in the heat? Could you do it in, in an indoor track? that has AC. That's the situation that we are at right now. And it's really tough for me to see these kind of stories. And we have a graph for you here that I found. And essentially, it credits to the National Center for Catastrophic Sport Injury Research on this. You look at the dates from 2010 to 2014, that darker chunk is direct football related deaths. Look at 1990 to 1994, way less than. Look at 1995 to 1999. We're almost on par with that. Or excuse me, 1989 to 19, 1985 to 1989. So we're on par with 20 some odd years ago in terms of college football related deaths, direct college football related deaths. That's not, that's not progress and that's not what I wanna see. And I really hope this is the last story I see about this situation. Players losing their lives for tackling issues and poor nourishment. And again, it falls on the coaches. We want you to weigh in, folks. Again, comment on our comment bar on the show here. Do you or would you allow your kids to play football? I think it's really a legit question these days, especially in light of this recent story and in light of Aaron Hernandez, another example with the severe CTE that he had. Right, the wear and tear that goes on. So parents, and perhaps future parents, comment, do you, would you allow your kids to play football? And uh, we'll show some of those comments here throughout the show. So again, the common denominator, coaching staff. They gotta get better teaching the fundamentals. They gotta get better as essentially parents, they're secondary parents, making sure these players get the proper nourishment and get the proper water breaks that they need, especially in this excessive heat and especially during the conditioning drills. And that's the opening ramp. All right, we'll hit a quick break here on the Cam Rogers Show. Coming up on the other side, we have Pete Shepard of ESPN Radio 99.3 in Southwest Florida. Stick around, it's the Cam Rogers Show.
And welcome back to the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. We have Pete Shepard of ESPN Radio 99.3. Of course, you may know him from WEEI in Boston as well. That's how I know him. Pete Shepard, appreciate you coming on. How are we doing, sir? Great, Cam. How are you guys doing over there? We are doing fantastic. A little hot here in Dallas, but uh, we're getting by. We're getting by, and uh, it's good to see that you're okay after the hurricane situation in Florida. Uh, certainly a, a tough situation for everybody in the Sunshine State. Um, and I want to get to an interesting little story here that's going on with the NFL and college football. You actually retweeted a story from the Washington Post about the differences between the NFL and college football right now. And it's something that I've touched upon on this show as well. It seems as though there's more excitement in college football. There's more tradition at this juncture than the NFL. And I think it's reflective of the ratings and the trend of the ratings. What do you think about the situation right now with college football and the NFL and how they're kind of going in opposite directions? Well, we did a whole show on this yesterday, and uh, went way past, you know, Colin Kaepernick as far as the ratings go. I mean, they're down 24% the NFL in week two from last year. I'll tell you, last night's game shocked the hell out of me. I couldn't believe it. I mean, the way uh, I expected that to be like 12-9, 16-13. But the problem is, you know, I think the new NBA, the previous NBA has a lot to do with it. And it has to do with salary cap, a lot of young kids, and NFL play, when they get to the NFL, uh, because of lack of practice time, pads, and all that stuff, they're not ready to play NFL football. And a lot of these NFL coaches are too stubborn. They won't adjust. Belichick is not one of them, by the way. I don't think he's one of them uh, either. But too many stubborn coaches. You see the lack of uh, offense. Guys being, they're playing not to lose. They're playing not to lose instead of trying to win the majority of them. And the, and the last were terrible last night. Was a nice surprise, but look at the matchups. Tell me a matchup that looked compelling. Atlanta, Detroit, Washington uh, hosted the Raiders. Maybe. Other than that, maybe you get a surprise or two. But there's not a lot of compelling games. You look at college games this week. I can't wait. I can't wait. Starting at noon time, NC State, Florida State around here. Uh, even uh, Florida and Kentucky, a third game win on the line for the. All right, Pete, I apologize there. We're going to have to cut you off with a little connection. Is kind of declining. So, again, we'll, we'll hopefully uh, square away the connection problems that we have with Pete right now. But, uh, look, it's a very real issue. It's a very real issue because, look, you look at the ratings, and the data is there to support this theory in that the quality of play in the NFL is, is declining, and the excitement around the college football realm is only getting better. And the time slots are better for college football as well. Uh, you know, Saturday afternoons, you know, you're getting ready to go out or whatever, and you're throwing on games. Or 12 o'clock on a Saturday. Maybe you're a little hungover from the Friday evening before, and you're just chilling and watching games. So the situation with college football is only getting better. The NFL has to look at itself in the mirror and really decide, what are we going to do to change? What are we going to do to create as much excitement as college football creates? And I think that's something that Roger Goodell, perhaps the NFL PA, can review and look over and hopefully improve from there because it's a very real issue the nfl is not as robust as i once thought it was right i mean look fancy football it's great and everything and it's kind of helping out the rating situation but going forward the nfl needs to realize things are getting rougher people are watching less NFL football, people are watching more college football. And the games this weekend across the college football sphere are pretty exciting as well, and I'll talk about one of them later. Mississippi State and Georgia, of course, will be a really fun one. And so I think that the NFL should be reading these headlines, reading this Washington Post article, by the way, that it's very in-depth in terms of the situation right now, and make changes 
I mean, look at uh, Thursday Night Football, for example. That game last night, yeah, it was probably one of the more exciting ones. But the entire schedule of Thursday Night Football, not well watched. Not a lot of people tune in for it. Not a lot of people get excited about it. First of all, I mean, when the games are exclusively on NFL Network, you're leaving some people out, right? I mean, when it's not on ESPN or it's not on CBS, which it has been in the past, those exclusive NFL Network games, you're going to lose audience. By the way, I got a package on Spectrum, the sports package, and they didn't have NFL Network. So that's kind of like where we're at. Like the NFL Network is hiding from, from packages. So uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, we still have a lot more weeks slates, if you will, of college football and the NFL to see if they can improve and to see if perhaps college football regresses to the mean. And we get your comments here. We have Terry Cole saying, yes, I would and did let them play football. Now my grandsons play and hope to see my great-grandson play. So that was in light of my opening rant there asking folks, do you slash would you allow your kids to play football? And look, I think if you have a feeling where you want your kids to play, go for it. But I think the changes need to be made in terms of protection, okay? Making the protection a little better. And the coaching staff needs to improve. We have James Yoder here. Yes, I would allow my kids to play football. Point blank, flatly, boom. Look, it's the, the ultimate team sport. Teaches great values. There are a lot, a lot of positives to football. We have Bobby here. If you love it, it would be worth it. I would certainly guarantee that even though some you know, post-NFL players out there, so retired NFL players, who may be suffering some sort of damage to their brain, don't have any regrets because they love the game so much. So we have another comment here from Bobby as well. What if you got paid like the NFL, would you do it then? <laughs> That's a good point. I mean, you're making a lot of money, and you got to look at the financial side of it, putting food on the table, right, you know, paying the bills. Uh, college football, you, you can't get paid right now. The NCAA doesn't allow it. So, you know, if you want to make a career out of something you love, the NFL is the way to go uh, in terms of your passion for football. A reminder that we want to know what you think. Do you slash would you allow your kids to play football? I think it's a very real question. Uh, because of this recent CBSSports.com exclusive, they came out with the story first in terms of these two uh, direct college football related deaths and so in, in the differences kind of bring about two different conversations right the differences in how those occur the heat ex uh, exhaustion and a tackle in a subsequent neck injury so one's about form the other is about perhaps uh, not enough water breaks or the conditions were too rough you know I remember and you I'm sure you all out there have watched remember the Titans right I mean, there was a time in that movie where, you know, water was seen as weak. It was a weakness. That's how it was back then in football. And perhaps part of the problem is that some of the coaches right now are from that era, right? There are still some of those coaches who still believe in that kind of no pain, no gain sort of deal. And that's just a mentality change that we have to have. And we need procedural changes as well, especially at the youth level, because it starts right there, when brains are still developing. Uh, and so, I mean, in college, brains are still developing. So it's a conversation that we need to continue to have. And again, we want you chiming in here. Perhaps you are a 20-something, and maybe one day you'll have kids, or you already have kids. You want to kind of throw in your thoughts on, in terms of would you slash do you allow your kids to play football. We have Richard Allen here. If I could go back, I would have never put pads on ever. I tell all my younger cousins it's not worth it. That's a very interesting perspective, and a lot of people feel that way, Richard. I mean, it's a sport that's not meant for everyone. I mean, I wish I could have played actual football, but I knew I'd get destroyed. I mean, 5'9", buck 55, come on. So uh, that's why I played intramural football. But uh, flag football, of course. We have another comment from Bobby. He doesn't think it's the coaches, it's the players. They need to say something. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a give and take type deal, Bobby, absolutely. I mean, if you are tired and you're beat up, 
you know, you, you should ask for a water break. You should ask for some time off. But you know what? Then that attaches the stigma. I mean, players are kind of afraid to go out and speak out against that because they feel that they'll be labeled by the coaches, labeled by their fellow players. Nobody wants to be that person to ask for a break. And we'll bring up the way in uh, right here, right now, just to remind you all. Because it's a conversation that I hope we continue to have, in the, and I hope it stays in the forefront of society, and it improves the situation with football. Uh, and I think the Aaron Hernandez headline brings that to light even further. Actually, the studies that we're seeing left and right with CTE and the beat and batter some of these players are in the NFL, post-NFL life, uh, it's tough. I mean, Ed Cunningham, you may recall that name, insider, college football insider for ESPN, he left solely because he could not essentially be involved with a sport where players are losing their lives, players are getting hurt, players are being uh, debilitated essentially because of the rough play that is going on. So literally a guy left a career, a very good analyst left a career because he couldn't take it anymore. So, and there's, uh, there's some good articles out there about him and his story. And he's probably seeing this story out of CBS Sports and thinking to himself, look, I told you so, we gotta look at ourselves in the mirror. And I showed the graph earlier in the opening rant at the beginning of it. In 1985, 1989, you're at that same number of direct college football related deaths as 2010, 2014. I'm leaving out 2015, 2016 here as we show you again because that's only one year. We, I want to make it comparable to a four year window here. So it's a real problem and hopefully we can have a discussion going forward and I'll say this one more time. Common denominator, the coaching staff. I really do believe that. Yes, the players can help the situation if they want to speak out and I mean, that would be nice, but let's be real, will they? I mean, if you're a football player out there watching right here, right now, do you have the wherewithal to just ask for a break out of nowhere and get screamed at by your coaches? Because that's what's going to happen in a lot of cases. So there you have it. Uh, my apologies there to uh, Pete Shepard for the situation with the interview. Hopefully we'll get him on at another episode of the Cam Rogers Show. He really is a great listen, and he's, of course, with 99.3 ESPN Radio. We're going to hit a quick break here on the Cam Rogers Show. Coming up on the other side, I'm giving you the can't-miss games this weekend. Stick around. Man crates, awesome gifts for men in real wooden crates, wrapped in a cocoon of duct tape or housed in ammo cans that are virtually indestructible. Some gifts he'll get to assemble himself. Some gifts you'll beg him to share. And some gifts are sealed inside layers of rock-solid concrete. Gifts guys love, from grilling gear to old-school video games and more. Man Crates, awesome gifts for men. And welcome back to the Cam Rogers Show. It is about the bottom of the hour, 10.30 on the East Coast. Just wrapping up the discussion about football and perhaps some of the rough situations that can come out of it. And hopefully we have a further discussion about deaths related to college football going forward. We are presented by Man Crates. Go on to mancrates.com slash chat sports to get, honestly, is the dream gift for that special dude out there, brother, Husband, boyfriend, uh, dad. I know Father's Day just passed, but we got Christmas coming up. So, Man Crates, a box covered in duct tape with dude stuff filled in it. You can check it out online. You can select certain objects, items that you want in there, and you can buy it as that next Christmas gift. I think I'm going to do it. I'm going to log on to mancrates.com slash chat sports and buy an early Christmas gift for my dad, probably some golf gear, a big golf guy. He's a beer guy as well. 
He is a Patriots fan, which I don't really approve of as a Ravens fan, but I digress. Mancreates.com slash chat sports. That's where, what we're presented by here today on the Camp Rogers Show. All right, let's get to the can't miss we, uh, games this weekend before we get to Sarah Perlman. And number one here, Mississippi for 11 Georgia. I'm calling this the second in command game. What does that mean? Who's second to Alabama in the SEC? We'll know after the wrap up of this one. Seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time on ESPN tomorrow. And these teams kind of mirror each other in that they have really good run defenses. In fact, Mississippi State has only allowed 103, 101.3 yards on the ground this year. Georgia is less than that at around 70 yards on the ground. So it's a really exciting game when you look at the front sevens and you juxtapose the two. And of course you have a young quarterback in Jake Fromm who has thrown 57 passes in just three games literally been barely throwing. So they're hiding Jake Fromm right now with Nick Chubb, of course, the running back for Georgia, who's had really a fantastic season so far. By the way, this is Bulldogs versus Bulldogs, which is interesting. Uh, and Mississippi State will commit to stopping Nick Chubb. I mean, that's what's gonna happen. And it's gonna come down to Jake Fromm. Can he get it done for the Bulldogs, the Georgia Bulldogs, in what will be a hostile game? And so, I don't know. I mean, look, he looks just okay versus Notre Dame. They got the win, but he kind of was just managing the game in that one. It was a close one, 1917. Uh, that was in South Bend, so it's impressive in that it was a road victory. But Mississippi State, I mean, they're coming off really a great win against LSU. And we showed you some of the highlights earlier. Uh, they're feeling good, and I like the quarterback there in Nick Fitzgerald over Jake Fromm in this situation. I think that's what it's going to come down to. I think both run games will be neutralized. Can Fromm go point to point through the air with Nick Fitzgerald? Don't think so. But it's going to be a good one. And this will be a test. Who is second in command at Alabama right now? We'll see. Georgia, Mississippi State. Next game here, 4.05 Eastern Standard Time. This one's on Fox. Seattle taking on the Tennessee Titans. This is a game of Worst offensive line in football, and perhaps a top two offensive line in football. Seattle's, of course, being the worst. Tennessee having a great one. Jack Conklin there at the tackle position. Taylor Lewan at the, another tackle position, left tackle. They have a good interior as well. Jones at center. You know I'm a big offensive line guy, folks. So this is going to be an exciting one. And I, look, Seattle has 21 points in two games so far. I mentioned that at the open of the show. And... They're going to have to run the football effectively and have some good play action and roll Russell Wilson out because he can't stand there in the pocket and, and just dissect the defense. He's not going to have time. I mean, anything more than a three-step drop in the pocket is not going to work for Russell Wilson this year. Yes, I picked Seattle to make it to the Super Bowl against the New England Patriots. And yes, they can mask this problem of an offensive line, but the defense has to carry them. And I think Richard Sherman knows that because he recently said that that's what they have to do. I mean, he said it nicely, but I mean, he realizes, and I'm sure the whole defense realizes that offensive line is not going to do them any favors. Tennessee has a really good front seven, low key. Derek Morgan, Brian Arakpo, they had some pretty big games so far this season, a big one against Jacksonville last week, and I think they're going to come up big in this one. They're going to terrorize that offensive line for Seattle. And Seattle has not been very good on the road in September. The Seahawks don't have a victory on the road in September since their Super Bowl season. So, I mean, 2013 we're talking about, right? Absolutely unbelievable. So Seattle, look, I mean, they're going to have to run wild away from the likes of Jarrell Casey and Arakpo, but it's going to be a fun game. I'm excited for it. If I had to pick a team... Right now, I would actually take Tennessee. I think they get this victory. I think this is a statement game for them against a Seattle team that certainly has the goods to be in the Super Bowl this year. And game number three this weekend. Oakland versus Washington. Sunday night football, baby. Let's do it. 8.30 Eastern Standard Time on NBC. Look, I think the Redskins hang around in this game and very well may steal it for a victory. They came out of a win nicely against 
the Los Angeles Rams. You see the highlights there, a late touchdown in the fourth quarter to get the victory. Oakland last week rolled versus the New York Football Jets on the West Coast. Oakland coming now to the East Coast to take on the Redskins. And I think it's going to be a game where injuries are going to be part of the conversation, right? I mean, you have Jordan Reed, Chris Thompson, Samaje Perine, P. Ryan, excuse me, uh, all have injury issues. So we will see going forward uh, how these players shake out in terms of the injury report. We probably won't know until I'd say 6.30 Eastern Standard Time if some of these players will play for Washington. But I think the Washington Redskins actually steal this game and they beat the Oakland Raiders on Sunday Night Football. We'll have a quick reaction poll here. We want to know your thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. Which of these games are you most excited for? Mississippi State versus Georgia. Again, the second in command game, as I say. Seattle versus Tennessee in the NFL. Oakland versus Washington in the NFL. Or other. And we want you to put that angry face there if you prefer another game because you weren't impressed with my picks here. So laughing face for that college game there. Give us a heart for Seattle versus Tennessee. A wow face for Oakland versus Washington. And again, an angry face for another game. So those are the can't miss games this weekend. Folks, your weekend is planned for you. You are welcome. So book uh, some time on the couch for some fantastic matchups coming up across college football and the NFL. All right. We are going to hit a break here on the Cam Rogers Show. Coming up on the other side, we have Masson's own Sarah Perlman. We'll talk about the MLB and many other topics here on the program. Stick around. It's the Cam Rogers Show. Man crates. Awesome gifts for men in real wooden crates. Wrapped in a cocoon of duct tape. Or housed in ammo cans that are virtually indestructible. Some gifts he'll get to assemble himself. Some gifts you'll beg him to share. And some gifts are sealed inside layers of rock-solid concrete. Gifts guys love, from grilling gear to old-school video games and more. Man Crates, awesome gifts for men. All right, welcome back to the Cam Rogers Show here on Chat Sports Live. And we have Sarah Perlman of Masson. She covers the Nationals and the Orioles out there in the Beltway area. By the way, class of 2017 as well. So uh, we're both fresh out of college. Sarah, appreciate the time. What's good? Absolutely not much. Happy to join you. I listened to you before. It sounds like you got a good gig over there. Hey, it's absolutely fantastic, and uh, I just, you know, I'm dealing with the heat here in Dallas. I actually have a question about that. I'll get to that later. But I got to start off with a nostalgic question because we're both out of college, and I have to ask you, I mean, you had some fantastic memories at college, I'm sure. I want to know, what do you think is going to stick with you in terms of your favorite college memories going forward in the real world, shall we say? Oh, gosh. That's a good <laughs> question. I don't even know. I think I'll just look back on the college game days uh, finishing at University of Florida I miss those college football days so I'll hopefully get back after the baseball season's over and see a game absolutely I remember my days uh, at Maryland with college football in fact uh, you know I had to squeeze in that nostalgia question I'm someone who watches One Tree Hill to remember my high school days so that's the kind of level I'm at you know by the way public I just went out I watch One Tree Hill I'm sorry all right Sarah <laughs> let's uh let's talk about the Orioles here because they're my team. I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan. You've been covering them. And look, do we have any shot? Like, should I just give up? Should, can they make the playoffs? I feel really sad to tell you that they cannot. Uh, they're not technically eliminated yet, but they're fighting for third place right now against the Rays. I mean, it's, it's unfortunately not going to happen this year. But looking ahead, I think the 2018 season, if they get some better starting pitching, they can make a good run. But it's tough. I mean, the AL East, as you know, is just the toughest division. Yeah, absolutely. Dan Duquette, get on it, please. Sign some starting pitching. Uh, Sarah, this is interesting here. Of course, you were 
a D1 soccer athlete back in the day. And so I want to kind of pick your brain about that because I feel like in a way it might have prepared you for a career in sports broadcasting. I know my intramural quarterback career, even though it was mediocre, kind of, you know, got me ready for this kind of thing. Did it help you at all in terms of uh, the beginnings of your career here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you think about playing a D1 sport, it doesn't compare to the professional level, of course. That being said, you know what it's like to give up a lot of your life outside sports. Um, so I think I can relate to the athletes on that bit, you know, you know, when they want their space or how they're feeling, if they're really tired or whatever's going on. So I think that helped. And also, you know, kind of just learning the game and having an appreciation for sports outside of covering it, but also playing and knowing what they're going through kind of day in, day out. So absolutely. And I, I knew the questions I liked getting as a soccer player. Uh, so I like to give similar questions to athletes, you know, bring them down hundred percent help. Yeah, the uh, only experience with soccer for me, one game when I was six and I cried on the field because I didn't want to do it. Sorry, Sarah, I wasn't a big soccer guy, but uh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, I want to ask you about uh, an exclusive that came out of USA Today about Bryce Harper. When I saw the alert, I was like, all right, I have to ask her this. It looks like he's returning, and I want to know what your thoughts are in terms of how crucial he is to that lineup, especially for the Nationals' postseason aspirations, and let's face it, they haven't gone deep recently in the playoffs. That's the truth, unfortunately. I think this year will be different. I mean, time will tell, but it's huge. Of course, they've been able to win games without him. Don't get me wrong, but they want him back. I actually was talking to one of our beat reporters a few days ago about the same thing about the Nationals. They were averaging five and a half runs per game with him there, now just four without him. I mean, he was batting 326 before the injury. You want that back in the lineup. So it'll be huge. I mean... I know he wants to do it for Jason Worth and the team itself. So I think having him back will be amazing for the NLDS. I know you saw we'll take live uh, live hitting tomorrow against pitches. And then, of course, hopefully we'll see him in Philly or maybe against the Pirates before they head into the And, of course, I mean, it's been a crazy season, Sarah. I mean, you got the Cleveland Indians and that streak, right? I mean, you have Alex Gordon making home run history. How fun for you has it been to really cover, of course, the Nationals and the Orioles, but be a part of a season that has just been so historic? It's been unbelievable. Um, I guess it's easy to say I never thought I would love baseball as much as I do, and I mean that in the best way possible. It exceeded all of my hopes. I mean, it's been such a fun season. Talk about the Orioles' ups and downs, of course, uh, but then you look at the Nationals, and they've been really, really great. It's so fun to cover. Even their clinching was awesome, but... Talk about the Indians. I don't think people realize how hard it is to do what they did. You know what I mean? So it's just been really a dream to watch the Dodgers play so well and lose so many games, like what, 11 in a row. So I mean, it's been up and down, but such, such a fun season to cover. And I'm really excited heading to the playoffs. And of course, playoff baseball, there's nothing quite like it. And of course, Sarah, you, it seems, lived in Florida for a long time. So here it goes. I need some advice yep. from you because I just moved to Dallas. It's literally fall today, and it's like 95 degrees. The antiperspirant can only do so much. How did you deal with the Florida heat? Tell me. Gosh, I'm born and raised there, so it's nothing to me. I'm, I'm nervous for the winter, so we could switch uh, for that season, and, and that'll be fine. I don't want snow. I don't want any ice on the roads. I like the heat, but you know what? You got to embrace it. Oh, man. Okay, you're in for a rude awakening in the Beltway. I mean, I remember walking to class in, like, zero degrees. Like, it was, it was brutal out there <laughs> in Maryland. But, but uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm going to have to change. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe a lot more dry fit Nike shirts. Who knows? Uh, Absolutely. Sarah, let's ask about the uh, postseason here and your thoughts, of course. I mean, of course, you're going to be covering the Nationals. The Orioles aren't going to make it. It's tough for me to say. But is this team, like, no. a legit contender finally? Like, is there a different feel around the team this year? I mean, years past, they've really had great seasons, but they haven't really cashed in. Is this kind of their year? You know what? I think it is. And I tell everyone that only because I've never seen such solid starting pitching. You think about Max Scherzer. He now is Steven Strasburg, which I didn't have before. He's been injured uh, the past few postseasons in and out. Gio Gonzalez, Tanner Roark. I mean, you think about those four starting pitching, and it, it's hard to beat, not to mention the acquired relievers they had. Uh, in the end of July, Sean Doolittle has been a lights-out closer for them. So when we actually compared them at Mass to other teams and how they'd look against the Cubs in L.A. And you know what? 
I hate to say it early, but I feel like it could be their year. Because they're just outstanding. They're young and they're fresh. And I think a lot of the players, you look at Steven Strasburg and Bryce Harper, and they want to do it for Jason Worth because it could be his last year as an Asheville. You never know. So, you know what, I'm going to have to say it is. I, I think they're an awesome, fun, uh, exciting team. I'd be surprised if they didn't go far in some way. And it seems as though you really grew up with sports, Sarah, kind of looking at your bio and uh, your experience. And uh, I want to ask you, when did your career aspirations really kind of take shape, uh, you know, as a fellow broadcaster? Uh, you're getting deep. So played college soccer my first two years. Uh, I wanted to intern, but as you know, I'm sure you've heard playing a Division One sport, it's really, really hard. Sure. So I kind of weighed my options and decided after two years I was going to hang up the cleats uh, and start interning. So I knew that I wanted to get into it all along, uh, and I wanted to give back to the world of sports what they've given me, such such amazing memories with friends, and it kind of turned me into the person I am. So I started with the Sirius XM uh, with the soccer channel, because soccer was my thing, and from there I knew how much I loved it. Went from radio to TV and, and picked up gigs from there, and it kind of took off, and I'm really happy. All right, so give us a uh, chat sports exclusive here, Sarah. I want to know, what kind of content can we expect from you going forward with the uh, Nationals and Orioles? Give me something good. Oh, gosh. Well, that's exciting. I will give you an exclusive. So the Nationals will be traveling with them uh, for the playoffs. And their sideline reporter is Dan Coco. So you'll see some of him on there. Uh, you'll see Mark Zuckerman. He is the writer from AspenSports.com. You'll see us do a lot of interviews with him on the road and hopefully get – uh, maybe their play-by-play -play and, and color analyst to get on our show and just talk about baseball. So we'll be at the event. So tell everyone to stick to our digital coverage, Facebook Live, Twitter, Instagram, uh, because you guys will see plenty and plenty of coverage, exclusive coverage inside uh, the clubhouse as well during playoffs. So that'll be really fun. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Sarah Perlman had a fantastic career so far. It's only going to get better. And by the way, Sarah, what are your thoughts? I mean, I kind of want to challenge you in a game of World Cup. Should, should we make that happen? Absolutely. <laughs> that would be an absolute beatdown. I would love to see the Vegas line on that one. All right, folks, Sarah Perlman of Masson. Check out her content with Masson Nationals and Masson Orioles. Sarah, keep up the great work. Really enjoy it, and all the best to you. Thank you so much. Same to you. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. All right, there you have it, folks. Sarah Perlman, many thanks to her for coming on the program. And, uh, of course, she's got a busy fall coming up covering the Nationals in their postseason berth. Orioles, eh, it's kind of rough, but that's okay. That's all right. Let's get into the final word here. Talking about the PGA Tour and their scheduling. Because it falls in line with football, and I think there's a problem here. First of all, the PGA Tour recently released their 2017-2018 schedule, 50 events, and basically the same as this past year. So it starts October 2nd and September 30th. It's essentially a year-long schedule. And many people are arguing that there are way too many events and things like that. Well, I read an interesting piece where the priority for the PGA Tour right now is the players. And of course, the, the more opportunities that the players have to get their PGA Tour card, they're gonna make those opportunities. And so the priority right now is in the fans. But here's the deal with the 2019 schedule. So they moved the Players' Championship to March. They moved the PGA Championship to May. So that leaves a really big window of flexibility in August. And what do I mean by that? Well, right now the PGA Tour is playing the Tour Championship, which is the final leg of the FedEx Cup playoffs. That event is bleeding into week three of the NFL, bleeding into week four of college football. So ratings, 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 drastically drop once football begins. And 2019 may have to be the year when the PGA Tour and Commissioner Jay Monahan decide to end the FedEx Cup playoffs a little earlier because Ratings are going to take a hit. Look, here's Phil Mickelson saying, quote, to accumulate with three FedEx Cup events instead of four and finish the year before football starts when there's really nothing else to compete with. So you're not competing against anything if you end the FedEx Cup playoffs a little earlier. Why roll that dice? Look at the data, Jay Monahan. 
Look at the situation with your ratings. They're going down every time college football and NFL starts. I'm a big golf fan, folks, big Tiger Woods fan. I love following the PGA Tour because it's a week-to-week -week thing. You always have a new tournament to look forward to, kind of like with the NFL. Every week, you have a new slate of games to look forward to. But if they follow that same schedule model that they're going to implement this year, which obviously they won't with the movement of May and March with the two big time events, but if they stay with the FedEx Cup playoff schedule, that's gonna be an issue. First of all, you're gonna have many more small tournaments in August because you're moving the PGA Championship. And you're honestly just kind of pushing and kicking the can down the road to really wrap up the season. I understand we need to have events for tour players to get their full-time PGA Tour card. I understand that, totally. But at the same time, you got to look at how to make the money, the move off, right? The advertisers, the revenue. And how do you get those advertisers and how do you get that revenue? You need good ratings. You need good numbers, especially when you're trying to sell this whole concept of the FedEx Cup playoffs, where you go from a certain number in one event to a certain number in another event, in the next one, I should say, in terms of shrinking the field. So this week, there's only 25, 30 players playing. They shrunk it down from 125 all the way to 25 or 30 for the Tour Championship. I like that concept. I like the concept of the FedEx Cup point standings and creating excitement and playoffs and yeah, that's fun and everything. But it's bleeding into the NFL schedule and it's got to stop. So next year, nothing's changing really. There are a couple of new events for the Tour, 50 events in nine countries, exciting stuff, sure. 2019 is when the big changes are happening, right? With the Players' Championship and the PGA Championship, Jay Monahan needs to go a step forward and declare that the FedEx Cup playoffs need to end in mid-August. Something like that. Because I need, my, even my interest kind of shrinks a little bit with the uh, PGA Tour when the FedEx Cup playoffs kind of go into football season because I'm transitioning to football, I'm getting ready for football. By the way, Spectrum doesn't give me Golf Channel, and it's the sports package, but I digress. It's a problem. And I think the PGA Tour needs to look at this and make some adjustments. I think we can still fulfill the duty of creating opportunity for players in the PGA Tour to get their full-time tour cards, to get their full-time status. Yes, the PGA Tour is a grind. I mean, it's as big of a grind as the NFL, as the NBA, et cetera. I mean, a lot of these players come from humble beginnings, sleeping on air mattresses for, for host families, you know, going tournament to tournament, trying to earn their way to the PGA Tour. You have the web.com tour, which is like the AAA of golf. And you have many qualifiers where players are trying to vie for status on the tour, it's a tough, tough road, and I get that. And I understand that the PGA Tour wants to have a lot of events to give a lot of opportunity for the players. That's fine. All you're doing is cutting down three or four weeks. Here's another solution. Just have three FedEx Cup playoff events. Not four, just three. And don't do that bye week before the BMW Championship. Because what they did this year, and what they have been doing, is they have one FedEx Cup event, the Barclays, slash the Northern Trust Open now. Then you have what was the Deutsche Bank. And so, or excuse me, the Deutsche Bank is now the Northern Trust Open. And then you have a bye week, right? And then you have the BMW Championship and the Tour Championship this weekend. So that's five weeks. If you cut it down to three, get rid of the bye week and get rid of one of the playoff events, there can be more excitement because there's more action within three weeks. And Phil Mickelson said recently that that's what they should do. You know? So come with three FedEx Cup events instead of four. More excitement. It's boom, 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 as Phil said. Just get through it. And you can build momentum, build excitement with the TV ratings and things like that. And you can avoid college football. You can avoid the NFL. You can avoid all of that. Because even though the ratings are going down, for the NFL right now, the ratings are going up for college football. So that means round three, 
on Saturdays will be hit by college football, and the final round on Sundays will still be hit by the NFL because the NFL still has a good following, it's safe to say. So that's the situation with the PGA Tour right now. It's rough, but they need to make some sweeping changes for 2019 in the August sector. Jay Monahan has said recently that he has not really thought about those kind of changes in 2019. And clearly, Jay Monahan is not looking at the data. Of course, BJ Tour Commissioner and Jay Monahan. So he needs to, and hopefully he will, because the PJ Tour is in a situation where their ratings will take a hit if they continue to go into the NFL and college football years, in weeks, I should say. So that's my final word with the PGA Tour. Uh, many thanks to Pete Shepard for coming on. Many thanks to Sarah Perlman for coming on the program. We are, of course, presented by Man Crates. Go on mancrates.com slash chat sports, and you can check out all the fantastic gifts that you can get that special someone, that special guy, that dad out there. Maybe you're looking for an early Christmas gift for pops. Go on mancrates.com slash chat sports. It's like a website full of masculinity. They're, all they're missing is a picture of me. Am I right, folks? I mean, come on. No, but I, I'm serious. Check it out. It's really a, a great concept. A box, a crate, essentially, covered in duct tape with all sorts of interesting items, beer, golf gear, fishing gear, etc. You name it, beef jerky, protein powder. Are you kidding me? Can't, can't get past that, right? So check it out. We're presented by Man Crates. Mancrates.com slash chat sports. Remember, you can download the Cam Rogers Show on the podcast version. Just search Cam Rogers on iTunes for iPhone people or on Google Play for Team No iPhone. The Cam Rogers Show. We thank you for tuning in. I will see you on Monday. A new totem pole. I'm hoping on Monday. More guests. This is the Cam Rogers Show. Have a great weekend. Man crates. Awesome gifts for men in real wooden crates. Wrapped in a cocoon of duct tape, or housed in ammo cans that are virtually indestructible. Some gifts he'll get to assemble himself. Some gifts you'll beg him to share. And some gifts are sealed inside layers of rock-solid concrete. Gifts guys love, from grilling gear to old-school video games and more. Man crates. Awesome gifts for men.